Great to have you with us. In our first story, the Supreme Court has ruled policy think tank Imani Africa and other civil society organizations that had attempted to join two cases against the compilation of a voters register by the Electoral Commission are not neutral. The seven-member panel of judges um, presided over by Chief Justice Kwesi Eniyabwa unanimously dismissed the request to allow the think tanks to join the case, saying their application is not supported by law. The groups have been at the forefront of the push to ensure the EC does not undertake the exercise, insisting this is a waste of scarce resources. Lawyers for the group filed an amicus brief application. This is a request by someone who is not a party to a case to be allowed to join it to demonstrate expertise or provide knowledge that will have a bearing on the case. An affidavit in opposition to this request signed by the commission's chairperson, Gene Mensa, says the groups have not drawn the court's attention to any law or decision that appears to have been overlooked by the parties in the case. She also said they have failed to demonstrate any expertise in law or regarding the matter pending to merit audience in the case. Now, she further adds, the groups have shown over time that they have an interest in the case in their public utterances. Now, lawyer for the groups, Joe Abwaji Debra, moved the application on Wednesday morning. President of Imani Africa, Franklin Kujo, spoke to Joseph Akable. It seemed quite clear and you would have better said your interest if you had just joined any of the parties instead of coming in as a friend of the court. Well, the suggestion that we should have made, the, we should have joined the case uh, is well taken. But the point also is that where, what, what does that mean for an amicus? You know, I mean, in other jurisdictions, people, people file amicus cases anyway and they take positions. Um, we do have an interest in the matter. I mean, to, I suspect that that is why we actually decided to file the brief. So to suggest that the brief was not was not neutral, I don't understand the language. Um, I think they probably didn't even read anything. But anyway, they made their decisions, and we can live with that. Is this the end of the road for you in terms of your activism related to this particular? Well, this is a country of law and order. I would think that the courts have decided what they have to decide. It doesn't stop us from activism. We'll keep on speaking about the matters because we think that these are critical matters of public policy. I think the courts have benefited soundly from sound public policy, but they chose differently. And so, well, here we are. Well, on the onset of this application, we did say that the, we were at the, 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 we were at the uh, benevolence, more or less, of the laws. And so what they decide to do, we'll live with it. Um, it's just that we are disappointed, though, that they didn't even consider the, the brief itself. Um, we think they would have benefited greatly from it. But look, the laws have spoken, and uh, we can't quarrel with that. We just have to live with it. But I hope that the decisions they arrive at eventually would be the decision that everybody can live with in this country. Otherwise, I'm, I'm just disappointed. I think my colleagues here are equally disappointed. Um, this was an introduction to how cases are determined in court. I was quite out. I mean, at some point I was laughing or two. Um, but I guess lawyers know their trade, and the judges also know their trade. So yes, we can't fault them. They, they, they did what they had to do. But I think that to suggest that the amicus was non-neutral uh, was a bit was a bit far fetched. Really. Yeah, the court says you have made comments that made your position quite clear, and you would have better said your interest if you had just joined any of the parties instead of coming in as a friend of the court. Well, the suggestion that we should have made the, we should have joined the case uh, is well taken. But the point also is that. We stay in the Ashanti region because polling stations in the Kwadasa constituency are preparing to wrap up polls as a higher number of delegates turned up to cast their ballots in the early hours of the elections. Parliamentary primaries of the NPP in that constituency had to be postponed to today due to contention on the voter album. Some polling stations, including a Genasi Rehabilitation Center, had all delegates showing up to cast their ballots by half past 11. Joining us live is Nanayao Jima. Nanayao, paint that general picture for us. 
So we are still in the Ejunase um, polling station, and in less than one hour, the election is supposed to end in all polling stations. And the tour that I've done through the constituency and in various polling stations show um, some of the constituents, most of them are almost done with the elections. Most of the people or the delegates have shown up so far to cast their ballots. Uh, some of them have a few people to go. For instance, um, if you go to Agrek in Zuma, there's just one person they're expecting to show up to cast his ballot. So at the moment in Ajunase um, polling station, most of the delegates who cast their ballots in the morning are coming back to witness the counting of the, of, the, of the ballot. Some are actually giving pressure to the Electoral Commission to end proceedings and count the ballot so that they know who is winning. But the Electoral Commission says you will have to go accordingly to um, the regulations that govern this election that we are having here today. So we have three people contesting for the seat, including SK Niyama Doctor, who is the incumbent member of parliament, Vic, uh, Vincent from Pomenu, and also Dr. Niyama, uh, and also one other who, 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 who are all contesting, Dr. Kisinyanko, Kisinyanko, he's also one of the people contesting the incumbent MP. So I will speak to some of the people, the delegates, and some of them are also representatives of the various candidates. I'll speak to them briefly, and um, fr from there we talk about security arrangements and others. So you've been here, you've witnessed what happened. Um, what are your impressions so far in this particular polling station and others? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we started around 7 o'clock in the morning and we were expecting about 27 people to come and cast their vote. And as it stands now, all the 27 people have come to cast their vote. So we're waiting for the time for the polls to start counting. And that is what we're still here waiting. Uh, the time expected to close polls is 1 o'clock and we are still here waiting for the time to start counting the ballots. Um, this man, Mr. Kuma, I've, have, I've been having a lot of interactions with, and he's very confident that his candidate, Mr. Vincent from Paul Manso, uh, Menu, will carry the date. Mr. Kuma, what makes you very confident? Because uh, all the people in the constituency love the man. All the delegates love the man. They know the good work he's doing around the constituency. And even the incumbent knows that Vincent is doing a good job in the constituency. So that makes me more confident that Vincent will win and wins hands down with a massive vote. I know that you will win. It will be prudent to give the opportunity to um, the representative of Dr. Kinsley Nyako, one other aspir aspirant for this constituency, to also talk to me about their chances. But before we talk about their chances, he was supposed to vote, uh, he was expecting to vote, but unfortunately for him, when he showed up, his name was not in the row. So he, he has been disappointed, but he has been beaming with smiles since morning, since I met him. I don't know why, even though his name is missing. But, so let's talk about that. Um, so your name was missing, uh, but still, you are, you are confident, you are okay. Why? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, this time, uh, it can be true okay, because just, uh, uh, the uh, two uh, are already uh, speaking uh, English. Uh -huh. You see, so you do it. And after this election, we shall come together as one. So, are you confident, sir? Um, Momo aspirant, that's Mr. Dr. Kinsley Nyako, because Ushima last four years or by. But unfortunately, um, he was beaten by SK Nyama. Um, this time, Nadia Nama Munja confidence said, me away. He wasn't prepared at that time, but this time, the Obama fooled him. It, you know, um, delegates in Nina Epenas, you know, hope he's going to win. So, Mr. JK Champon, I just spoke to his a representative for Dr. Kinsley Nyako, who is also contesting for the, the seat here at 
quite a constituency. So wrapping up, um, there have been high police and military presence in the constituency so far. And at an interval of 30 minutes, you see um, some military men and policemen entering polling stations to check on what is happening. And because of that, there have been a lot of discipline in all polling stations and it's been very calm here today. Thank you very much. We'll come back when we have the results coming in from Kwadaso constituency. Remember, Dr. Patrick Nyama, who is the incumbent MP there, is the chairman of the Health Committee of Parliament. And so if the unfortunate happens to him and he loses, he becomes the 12th committee chairman who has lost his MPP parliamentary primary. The rest of the day will show. Now, the Bunu East region, through, though the region is the last but one region to have recorded a positive COVID-19 case, currently has a total of 35 confirmed cases, with 13 clients discharged from transmission-based precautions and reintegrated into their communities. The region is mapping out strategies capable of tackling stigmatization associated with the pandemic. This was disclosed at a briefing held by the Regional Coordinating Council. Anna Sabit has more. Nearly one month after the Bono East region recorded its first COVID-19 case on the 26th of May this year, the region's case count currently stands at 35, according to the Regional Health Director, Dr. Fred Admakumbwati. The total number that we are having as a region is 35. For the 35, 19 of them are males and then 16 of them are females. The age ranges from three years to 67. Most of them are in their 30s for the cases that we have. At a press briefing held in Tichiman, Dr. Fred Admakum Boatin indicated that six out of the 11 districts within the region are currently with positive COVID-19 cases. Now, the breakdown of the cases are, for six of them, they are from two east. 20 of them are from Techiman Municipal. The one is from Enkraza South. And six of them are from Techiman North. And three of them are from Kintampo North. So we have six of the districts out of 11 having recorded cases. Bono East Regional Minister and Member of Parliament for Atibubu Amantin constituency, Mr. Kofi Amwakohene, indicated that with 13 discharged patients, the region is currently combating stigma head on to ensure that recovered patients are being accepted into the society. In Bono East, what we have done, and we did it before the media, is we've introduced a face, one of the contestants who participated in the past pageant that happened at TV3, Ghana's most beautiful, and our contestant was Pena, and she has just been introduced as a lead ambassador for fighting or combating the stigmatization that comes with the treated patient, COVID patients. And I believe that we are going to assist her in all directions so that she would lead and bring the people back to the society so that society would also embrace them. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Tichima. Very encouraging work going on there. So you can also contribute 10 Ghana CDs to this bold project. Now, away from COVID, the police CID has arrested two persons who are involved in the demolition of the building on the premises of the Nigeria High Commission. According to a statement from the police CID, the suspects have been charged according to the due laws in the Criminal and Other Offenses Act. Joining us is DSP Juliana Obing, Head of Public Affairs Unit of the Police CID. Who are these people, DSP? 
Hi, DSP, who are these people? We seem to have lost DSP Juliano, being head of public affairs unit of the police CID. We'll re-establish contact with her. Then we'll get more details about these persons who have been arrested. But you're seeing there, the, in your shot, the, what it remains of that building, which is said to be a part of the Nigerian High Commission to Ghana. Uh, as you can see there, um, a part of the wall has been broken down. There are some... Nigerians there who are very angry, who are visibly um, bothered, and they are protesting this demolition. Right, let's now speak to DSP Juliana Obing, Head of Public Affairs Unit of the Police CID. So, DSP, who are these suspects who have been apprehended? Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, Daniel, I do not have the police um, uh, pardon me, DSP. Um, the quality of the line is quite poor. Can you reposition yourself so we can hear you better? Okay. Is it better now? Much better. Let's hear you. All right. So I did say that uh, unfortunately we are not putting the names of these two suspects out now. The reason being that we do know that certain things are at high now. And then secondly, my information is that uh, we are picking something like to get some other suspects who were involved in the exercise. And so for these two reasons, we are not able to put out the names of these two suspects. But the two suspects that were arrested are being put on court today. Right. So how large is this gang which worked on this DSP? Do we know? Please come again. How many people are we looking for in total? Do we know? Uh, we do not know. Investigations are still ongoing, and so we could have a lot more of the suspects. Can you confirm that the people who carried out this demolition were accompanied by some state security officials of some sort? Well, I, I am not in a position to make that to accept or deny it as of now. What I do know is that the investigations are still ongoing. Is the site secure now? Is the site? The site for the demolition, is it secure now? It has been under security since um, Friday. Yes, and it still is under security. Please Right. Do we still have persons going there um, to agitate and protest? No, it's important of reason being that it is still a space under investigation. And so for now, we do not have people going there for any kind of... Um, but the embassy is working. Come again? Is the embassy working? I know it was on the premises of the Nigerian embassy. I really can hear you. Is, is the embassy working, the Nigerian embassy? Hello, DSP Obing. Unfortunately, we lost DSP Juliana Obing. She's head of the public affairs unit of the police CID. Now, staff of oil services company Schlumberger have described as inhumane and barbaric the decision of management to place them on suspended employment for a year. This means workers have been sent home without salary or benefits and are unable to seek employment elsewhere in the industry. The staff say they are being treated unfairly by management. Bright Downcraft is the local president of the General Transport Petroleum and Chemical Workers Union. He was speaking on Prime Morning on Joy Prime TV. We all have families, we all have dependents, we all have people that um, look up to, we, are, we look up to, uh, and they also look up to us. Sometimes, you know, we need to take care of people outside um, our own confines. If you are asking an employee to go on suspended employment up to a year without pay, and also, you see, look at one of the conditions they place here. Employment is not guaranteed for any specific position. So it's not guaranteed that you will come back. Okay. It's in their own words. I'm not, I'm not quoting them or I'm not uh, picking words for them. And during this period, engagement in, in any employment within the oil and gas industry will be deemed as re resignation. So if I'm staying home, I'm not being paid, I go look for a job. Within immediately I get a job. Industry. Yes, within the oil industry. Immediately I get a job. They terminate it. All your benefits, you lose it. You lose it. 
this is barbaric. This is wicked. This is not fair to the Ghanaian. Mm. And this is... sit down also because they need to be able to convince and make a case ask and to convince the other party that there is really the 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 need for this to take place right so right. for example they will have to prove that truly they are in either financial distress or truly the contract is frustrated or truly there's a force majeure that has impacted the, the, the company's business so much so that employee payments cannot be sustained. There is a lot of case to be made mm. to, to the other party to come to a firm understanding and agreement before you know any such action can take place. So for letters, the communication that goes to employees, for example, would have to um, have a part where the employees will have to acknowledge mm. on paper mm. that yes, they accept right but oh. you know this situation is even a bit more complicated because there's a union now deputy minister for employment and labor relations bright record brobe has assured the workers that his ministry will ensure they receive what they are due we will get to management and then bring the two together and ensure that whatever that is due workers whatever that management must do to bring absolute peace, this will be resolved. So I can assure him of that. He should try and bring all the documents he has to the ministry. Uh, if he comes and minister is not there, I will be there. Uh, and, and so he must be rest assured that these matters do happen. And when they do, uh, we do job and ensure that we put everything to rest and parties are happy. Normally, they don't even end up at the NLC when they come to the ministry. Mm. We have done this with lots of companies, Taka and all that. It, it went. So please, uh, the gentleman to hold his fire. But I can imagine the frustration that he's gone through. Right. But he, he should also be assured that when he brings these matters, he will invite the labor officer, my minister will sit through. My minister always brought me into such matters. And you make sure that we resolve this, this Right. So I have joining you today with me, Daniel Dazi. We're coming back with business and in business. PIAC demands accountability on utilization of some 1.5 billion CDs from Petroleum Holding Fund. Stay with us. Now, it's now time for business. And Sandra Senamafenu is standing by, uh, pardon me, Daryl is standing by um, to report business from home. Hi, Daryl. Hi, Daniel. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, Daryl, loud and clear. Hello, Daniel. Yes, Daryl, you're on there. Go ahead. All right. Well, in our first story this afternoon, the Public Interest and Accountability Committee, PIAC, is demanding accountability on the utilization of some 1.5 billion CDs from the Petroleum Holding Fund. The committee said the amount is neither available nor accounted for. PIAC is therefore asking Parliament to summon the Finance Ministry for clarity. More in the report. 
The 2019 annual report by the Public Interest and Accountability Committee, PIAC, revealed that Ghana has so far received $5.9 billion as revenue in the petroleum sector since the beginning of oil production in Ghana. Total oil production in 2019 went up by 15% as a result of higher volumes from the Jubilee and Sankofa Jinami fields. Despite this, the Public Interest and Accountability Committee, PIAC, says there is less to show on how proceeds from the commodity have been utilized. At the launch of the 2019 annual report, Chairman of PIAC, Number Waja believes it is about time Parliament and all mandated institutions demand accountability. Done a lot of engagement with Parliament, and we can only continue to engage Parliament to address these issues. But I will say that since PIAC is a citizen based committee, we need your support in this type of these matters when it comes up. Um, that is the only way. Probably we can put much pressure on Parliament. Well, Parliament also represents us anyway. So if we, the committee, present issues to Parliament and there is a seemingly lack of interest, or maybe the interest is not so high in Parliament, I think citizens' backup will also be useful in putting much, some pressure on Parliament to act. And I think it is the very reason you are preferred. That is why we are also saying so. For the third consecutive year, the Public Interest and Accountability Committee is raising concerns about the remaining funds which amounted to 1.5 billion cities yet to be accounted for. The committee is also making a proposal for the oil fund investment to be varied. Here is technical manager at PIAC, Mark Ajiman. Well, currently they are invested in safe instruments, so basically sovereign bonds. So we have recommended or proposed that this qualifying instrument should be varied so that part of our petroleum funds will be invested in low risk instruments, meaning low returns, and part should be invested in high risk instruments. That will guarantee high returns. So that is to regards of the operations of the IAC. They are in place, they are restructuring IAC. Uh, they've met a lot of stakeholders and they are putting final touches to that restructuring uh, process. Meanwhile, gas production in 2019 was the highest in the country. Our, uh, Ghana's cocoa regulator, Cocoa Board, has signed a loan facility for productivity enhancement programs of the cocoa sector. The $600 million loan, which was signed in November last year, follows two years of negotiations between Cocoa Board and development finance institutions, including the African Development Bank. Charles IT has more. Already, Cocoa Board has drawn $200 million from the AFDB loan to embark on various cocoa projects, including pollination and pruning. Joseph Bohin Edu is chief executive of Cocoa Board, expressing confidence in increasing cocoa yields to 1.1 million tons of cocoa by 2026 and 2027 crop year. Ghana Cocoa Board has set out to create a modernized, resilient, and competitive cocoa environment where all stakeholders strive towards a sustainable cocoa economy in which cocoa farmers and their communities thrive. Towards this end, Honorable Chairman, Cocoa Board seeks to raise the current productivity levels from 500 kilograms per hectare to an average of 1,000 kilograms per hectare by 2027. Chief Executive of Cocoa Board, Joseph Boahin Edu, has downplayed a report from the Writers News Agency that international risk underwriters pulled back from the 2020 and 2021 Cocoa Syndication Loan, citing COVID-19 risks. Speaking during the launch of the AFDB $600 million syndicated loan facility, Joseph Boahin Edu reiterated that Cocoa Board was in good standing with its international lenders who are all prepared to sign up for the loan facility in September. Management of Cocoa Board has cited various reportage on Cocoa Board syndication in newspapers and online news portals. As Cocoa Board's inability to raise its planned 1.3 billion US dollars through a syndicate of banks citing COVID-19 risk as a main reason. Management wishes to draw the attention of the international community and the general public that these publications are false and do not reflect the current engagements between Cocoa Board 
and the banks and financial institutions. It is worthy of note that Cocoa Board has prepaid the 2019-2020 loan facility in June 2020. Meanwhile, board chair of Cocoa Board, Hackman Owusu-Wajiman, has challenged Cocoa Board to explore domestic ways of pre-financing cocoa projects in the coming years. The minister would like to see us be able to pay for things ourselves and not go for loans. Despite the skillful accounting which has made us pay our syndicated loan three months ahead of time, we need to reinvigorate ourselves and make sure make our minister happy and our president happy and for that matter his colleague in Kuriwa, Alassane Watara, also happy. JICA and AFDB agreed to provide a $3.5 billion joint facility under the fourth phase of the Enhanced Private Sector Assistance for Africa Initiative. The loan marks the first time JICA and AFDB will be providing direct school financing under the EPSA4 as well as first non sovereign project. Well, meanwhile, Coco Boss says it wants to win itself off external lenders. Here is the CEO, Joseph Wahin Edu. Challenge to all of us because honestly, when we go to a syndicate, uh, we pay. The money they give us is not full of charge. You know, uh, once it's a loan, it means that we have to pay. And if you if you listen to my FNA, um, the past 27 years, loan that we contracted, we put all together. The cost of financing a loan comes close to about half a million dollars, about half a million US dollars. That general financing, the uh, participation fee, you know, uh, the legal fee, all those fees together, and then the interest when you put them together. $500 million. I'm, I'm, I'm sure $500 million could have done something significant for this country. So it is in our own interest to try and then win ourselves you know, from this as a location. We definitely have to look forward into the future to sort of uh, go off loans. And that's all in business for now. More coming up on the marketplace. Meantime, handing you over to Daniel back in the studio. Daniel. Thank you very much, Daniel. Hope you're keeping safe at home. I am. I am. <laughs> good, good. Can't wait to we'll see, see you back in the office. All right, then. Up next, right. we go to the home of Oreku Ampofo, who has the latest in sports.